good morning, or good afternoon, like wherever you are. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> yeah, I am Osmond Chuma. I'm a designer, a graphic designer by trade. I'm also now dabbling into, I'm now uh, almost like a slash educator. I've been doing some guest lecturing at the University of Johannesburg. I'm a co-founder of Mum Gabor's design studio uh, dedicated to celebrating like the African identity in, in different forms of art, design, poetry. I'm born and raised in Zimbabwe. But then I do switch in between Harare and Johannesburg. I can say sometimes I'm based in Johannesburg. So how many African languages are you learning and what are the interesting specifics, the differences between them? I speak Ndebele, Shona, English. I speak Zulu and I'm learning Sutu and uh, Chewa. Now, for example, when I'm listening to, to Venda, right, Venda sounds so similar to Shona, right? I remember the first time that I heard it, I was like, they're speaking Shona. But no, it's not. But I, can, I understand what they're saying, but I don't know what language it is, you see, because they're very similar. And then now being exposed to like suited, all this, I think it's almost like the, the words themselves that interest me. I was literally in the morning going by my coughing and this lady was, was speaking chair over the phone and, and it was beautiful, right? And then I, I, I literally just asked, how do I say good morning in chair? African languages are just beautiful and deep. Like it's, like it's almost like poetry. Someone just saying good morning, but it just sounds like poetry. Sometimes I just listen to people speaking that I'm like, it's beautiful. When I say I'm, I'm learning Sutu, I know f- phrases. <laughs> I know phrases. Yeah. And I really love to be able to learn like most of these languages because it's different. Sometimes it's how they put like the M and the Ws. And I think it's just quite rich, like all those African languages. And I think for me, that is where I think most of my inspiration comes from. It's literally like things around Africa. Like it's not just things that you see, but also what you hear, like languages themselves. If I could, I, I would literally wouldn't mind going to school just to learn languages again. Just learn how to speak Sutu for the whole year. I mean, the name that I, I'm able to pay rent, but just learning that, I would love to. English, Shona and Debele have been the most widely spoken languages in the country. There was a need to diversify indigenous culture. And in 2013, the constitution of Zimbabwe was amended to give impetus to the recognition of 16 languages. This made Zimbabwe hold the title of the most official languages in the world in the Guinness Book of Records since 2013. I know sign language is part of official language in Zim. Shona, if I understand correctly, it's a group of languages under Shona. So it's not just one language, it's like Karanga, Dori, Manika, I forgot the fourth one. Under Shona itself, then there's Nebele, then there's Donga. There's also Kosa in Zimbabwe. I was born in Gwanda, which is like the Bene side, but my dad is Kalanga. And then we grew up in Harare, which is a predominantly Karanga or Shona area. So my accent when I'm speaking in, in Zim, when I'm speaking my Shona, they'll be like, what are you? <laughs> when I go to Gwanda, they'll be like, your accent is so different. It's because inside the house, I'm speaking Devela. When I get out, I'm speaking Shona. And so it's like all this navigation of um, languages. And again, I came to Harare when I was five. And then also, like, these languages are quite different. So in Debele, you've got an L. In Shona, you remove that L and then you put an R, right? So then words, where there's an L, that is very confusing because there's an R. And also, as a kid, now trying to navigate all the spaces, like, it was quite funny. And for me, it was like, yeah, I'm trying to put that R, but I don't know how to say it. It's, it's just, but R is L. Yeah, quite interesting. And then my dad is Kalanga, which is almost, sounds kind of similar to almost Shona. But yeah, like, I just, Enjoy languages. Now, if I could, um, I'll be like, hello guys, my name is Azul Chuba. I speak 200 languages. That'd be great. That'd be amazing. <laughs> That's really yeah, interesting. I used to aspire a lot to linguistics. You know, at yeah. high school, trying to pick up languages. In that case, it was European languages, as we were taught. I'm from Poland originally, moved to the UK, and then okay. just really into linguistics and the stories behind the languages as well. And that's kind of when you discover the stories behind some of the words. We found in Swahili, it's very onomatopoeic, right? Things sound like the word itself. Is it fair to say you kind of grew up almost like a third culture kid within African cultures, right? Yeah. And you're absorbing that from different cultures. How was that? And what did that teach you from the different places you grew up? I was born in Uganda and then moved to Laweyo, which is also still in Debele. And then going to Harare, every single space is quite different. Like the many reasons uh, how people talk. When we're staying in Languanda, there's a guy selling paintings outside of the yard, right? And then again, like in Harare, we are going to this place called uh, Chapungu, a cultural village. And uh, I don't really remember why we we're going there, but it was one of those trips that we used to, used to go to, which is literally just literally close by the house, almost like 
the 20 minute walk. But that place is quite known in the sculpture industry as a, as a space of just sculptures. People would go there to buy sculptures or go to see almost like a gallery, an outside gallery. And it really didn't make sense. And also the space that we lived in, my dad worked there. So it was like a school and we lived in the stuff houses. But, but the buildings were, were kind of painted like with all these African murals. They were quite beautiful. So then it's, it's all this navigating. And then me going to school again, I'm passing through spaces where there's also art and all this stuff, but it never really clicks in. And I'm just navigating these ideas of me speaking Shona, but then a home developing. And it's just like gathering itself, gathering itself. Actually kind of interesting because I think I remember doing like an interview two years back and then that, that's when it clicked like, oh wait, my brain collecting all this data. And that is why now I'm able to be like, oh cool. But the place that I grew up in is called Daniko. Like a school. The, the school was built for liberation fighters who didn't go to school, who decided to go to the war to mm. liberate Zimbabwe. And then when they came back, because they're now injured, you could, they then built a school like to accommodate all those people, everybody who got injured or like everybody who got displaced and like, cool, you can come and learn, learn something, vocational training, and you can get an education. But what, what fascinated me was the logo outside. It was quite big, big, you know, beautiful. It included all these things like agriculture, carpentry, but it was beautifully meshed. And also like the murals like around the space. Right? I really never really thought about this until literally just a few years back where I was like, actually, the reason why I do my things is because of, of where I grew up. Like it was literally embedded in my subconscious. The visual language is putting together of symbols to make one mural, all that. Even though I'm doing it for like commercial use, like to tell a story, it's what I used to see when I was growing up, these big paintings, without even knowing what, what they were. You grew that appreciation of how art communicates culture over time, yeah. perhaps, right? And, right. May, and also you're creating things that communicate culture. How does that function? How does art communicate culture? I think it's by many ways, education and uh, preserving. For example, I think one of the most interesting things that we had at home was the, the yummy yummy stuff. And this stuff wasn't my dad's, but then it was like, like my dad's friend like from Germany who came and he left his stuff around. So then it was this big stuff, which literally showcases the story of Yami Yami. And the story is literally embedded on the stuff, right? It's Yami Yami on top and then this community at the bottom, like literally talking about how Yami Yami used to protect the people, like the Batonga people. And then when there's a drought, he would literally offer his body to Yami Yami and then people would cut. And I think art plays a very big role, like preserving in terms of one storytelling educating. Most people didn't know what Yam Yam was until most people go to Kariba or when they read about it. Or when they pass them by and then they see this stuff and they ask, what is this stuff about? Now we're moving in a space whereby how many people really want to learn about Africa? Very few. Because now it's more cool to be like in Europe, right? Some of the things that we were doing 20 years ago, like we're not doing anymore. Like some spaces, language is actually quite disappearing. So art can be used to preserve and that can be in creating whatever elements that we're creating so that the future people can read about it. You see, like what you can argue that there actually was a way of preserving the, the different civilization from way back like for us to understand what it is now because everybody who was during that time, 4,000 years is possible, but now we are trying to decode it and, and learning how it was 10,000 years back. Even though for them, it wasn't an art form, it was almost like a way of communicating. But for us, we're seeing it as both ways, an art form and as a technology, as a language. But for them, it was, this is who we are now. We're going to put it down. And now we're able to decipher that and say, cool, this is what is happening. This is what they did. And this is what we can learn from them. For example, finding all those things that they created many years ago, but we are now saying, how can we do it now? Oh, wait, there's no technology to do that now, right now. I think it's quite interesting how far an art form can contribute to cultures. Osmond creates works focused on learning more about African cultures and history and decolonizing the design systems. And I think that story goes back to 2017 when I was in advertising. During that time, I was feeling quite stagnant with the work that I was creating. And then I wanted something quite challenging. And I joined the Six Days of Challenge. But mine was more about creating letters that were inspired by Africa. And even during that time, like even my work at the agency was always aligned to something African or talking about Africa. And it was my first almost like opportunity to experiment zeta forms without being quite rigid to it needs to fit in this grid. It was more about celebrating the inspiration itself. I wanted when people looked at the letter form, they saw exactly the inspiration, where inspiration came from without even like, oh, oh what is that? And that made me look at many different things. And I think the cool thing about my project is the knowledge that I get when I'm researching a country, when I go deep and read, because I have to try and find something that really is speaking to the country. I see it as if the country has briefed me on the job and now I have to 
present something for them. That is how I see it. So something that I can give to the people. That is why I called the last project from 2020 to last year, Africa Love Letters. Africa, sometimes dash or semicolon love letters because it's almost like a letter to me, to, like to the African country say, so call. here's a gift. Here's what I've created for you for this independence. It's from me to you. And I've learned a lot. Sometimes people think that because in Africa, you know Africa. There is so much that I don't know about Africa. One of the most biggest misconceptions is that the Benin bronzes come from Benin. <laughs> <You're> just not. <laughs> and it's things like that, that sometimes people can just take and then use without digging deeper. And for me, when I look at this knowledge that I, again, I question myself, am I giving honor to the artifact, to the object, to the culture, to the ceremony? How will the people who celebrate this culture feel what they see an outsider creating this work. The truth is, I'm an outsider in that culture. That's the truth. However, I have to create it in a way that even they feel like I read, I understood. Even though I'm not Igbo or Yoruba, this was done with honor. I took in consideration why this, why that has been done. And I give it to them back as it is. But sometimes it is kind of stressful because am I perpetuating the past or am I perpetuating the new modern Western view of African ideologies? I have to ask myself, what am I saying? Sometimes the work will say it's exactly what it is. And sometimes I do leave questions like for the people to review it. Sometimes I will ask the question. Sometimes I'm saying our culture is beautiful. So it's like every single project has got a different way that I approach it. Because sometimes it is quite hard. So I can say with all the knowledge I've learned, I think it's learning to navigate between what I'm creating. But every single country has got a beautiful history, rich history. Like it's a lot. And I still don't know much. So I keep on going back. So how do you feel representing perhaps other countries, other nations, other, other tribes around Africa? How's the feedback been from them in terms of doing this? People loved it. People loved it. I think the interesting part was um, like social media has got so much pressure. <laughs> People started like almost like saying, oh, we can't wait to see my country. And the pressure comes from African countries because I have to work day and night just to meet the deadline. And then again, that was COVID also. So all alone, it's quiet, COVID. And then I have to meet three countries, independence tomorrow. The pressure was intense. At first, I was able to meet the deadline. Da, 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 da. But at some point, I, I literally had to think about my mental health in my body. So then I, w- I would start now, almost like delay by two or three days. And still people like love the work. I remember someone from Sweden reached out saying they've never seen an artwork like for their country that being represented in that way. And that was quite beautiful for me. This person is literally not in Africa, but they were able to see this and to literally reach out and say, yo, this is quite beautiful what you've done. Please keep it up. It was quite a beautiful and almost like inspiring thing like to keep on doing what I was doing because I wasn't just celebrating African countries, but I was celebrating Africans like all around the world who identify as from Cameroon, I'm from Ghana, I'm from Somalia, I'm from Eritrea, I'm from Tanzania. Being able to see this work Beautiful. Each country is uniquely portrayed. We wanted to find out what inspired the design style used for the specific countries. I think the back history to that is that when I went to Varsity, I was chasing the mark, right? So when you chase the mark, you make everything quite sure that you pass, you don't fail, because you can't afford to repeat again another year because fees, right? So my, my design style was almost like created already, quite clean and simplistic. And then with this, it was like a chance of experimenting, putting the grid away, like literally, let's be free, put text upside down, put text on the side, things that you never got to do. Here's a chance to create stuff for you. And I think that was my touch, experimenting, because I I tried to create every single country different and literally find a different way of approaching it. But every single project under that umbrella, I forgot love letters. And for me, sometimes my style, the love putting detail, sometimes I go quite simplistic. And I remember one of my favorite ones, because I love creating logos, I really love creating logos, and I love the idea of telling a whole story in just one symbol. And I think this one is for seashells. And I looked around, and seashells research all everything there, right? And I couldn't find something that I could grab onto. There was like a lot of stuff, beautiful, rich elements. And then I looked at the logo. It was for the 44th anniversary. And then when I looked at the, at the flag, it literally created a foe. I was like, just taking this and just doing this. I think I just went crazy. Like, oh, I'm, like I'm a genius. I'm a genius. And I'm like, calm down. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> calm down. <laughs> and for me, like I love that idea of literally using something quite simple. But sometimes I can go into quite detail. Almost like taking this piece, taking this piece, taking this piece, taking this piece, and then putting them together. So the creator symbol. In this case, I was like, you know, you need to experiment. Play around. Create little forms that long. Some of them are short. Have fun. I think it's just this, allowing myself to play and just create this work. 
I love what you said about that Seychelles flag. But by, by the way, I always say that's one of my favorite flags. It's just so like joyful, right? It is. I, yeah. I haven't been to the Seychelles, but it makes me want to go there. Yeah, so, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, yeah. And those moments in design when you like click, you just move something and suddenly it's something else, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, and yeah, and I love that those moments just make me go like, design is beautiful. I think as a designer, it's all about creating something new. And I think that is what design is about, creating something new finding new ways of communicating, not repeating the same thing instead of using this mobile bird on every single thing because everything has got this mobile bird on it. Every single thing, every government logo. You cannot be Zimbabwe without this mobile bird. <laughs> and for me as a designer, it's to find different ways of saying Zimbabwe without saying that because then you then reduce the whole country into just one item for like 20 years whilst we've got other things that can say Zimbabwe. And that's the thing for me, right? Cool, for this project, I will use the Maasai. But if I come back and do another project again, I'm not going to use them. I'm going to use something else. There's a thousand things that you can create. If you were to take a million designers from Kenya, you have to see a million ways of saying Kenya without saying one thing. There's a lot of things that can say South Africa. There's a lot of things that can say Malawi. As designers, we need to allow ourselves to think broader. This has been done. Yes, it works. But can you find other ways of saying it without saying that? Special ways of telling the stories. Your work shows a lot of research in all these yeah. different countries. Are there some unconventional way you've had to actually source this research that you'd like to share? The project happened whilst I was in lockdown. I would have loved to literally travel, but it was during lockdown. So then how the project was started, let me give you like a backstory to the project, like the African Love Letters. Sometimes there's like xenophobic attacks like South Africa. And I wanted to use Johannesburg as a living museum, as a living gallery. And I wanted to use the spaces of interaction, the spaces of conflict, as in the spaces of interaction. For example, if I could find a place, like an old embassy of a certain country, I could create my work and then put it up there. There's a space in uh, Alexandra, Alexandra is a township, and there was a place whereby a Mozambican was stabbed. I was going to go there and actually create a space to say, cool, let's have these conversations about foreigners, using those spaces to create like engagement. I think there was um, another fight between Nigerians and taxi drivers. And then having a taxi driver wearing a t-shirt that says Happy Independence Nigeria, using all the space around Johannesburg to almost say, you know what, we can have these conflicts, but we can also live like in harmony. If you look on my Instagram, you will actually see that I have the mock-ups, but I also have South Africans holding the posters. And those were literally people walking by, and then I just asked them, yo guys, can you please hold this thing and then I'll take a picture So my project. And then they're like, yeah, cool, shop. what is it for? Oh, no, no like Ghana is having its independence. And they're like, oh, I'd love to. And I really don't know those people. They're just passing by and I asked them. So then showing that these things can happen, but there's also love in these spaces. We also need to have these discussions. Two weeks later, lockdown. I literally had to source them. Like online, I literally had to look, in, look into academic papers, galleries, because like everything was closed. Libraries was closed. It was looking at galleries and museum online. Like everything was literally online. That is where I think I felt the power of being connected, of having internet at home. But the truth, I love holding things. I love going to galleries. If it was up to me, I would have loved to travel half the countries just to go and be like, here's this artifact. Taking a picture, literally, I would have loved that, like to feel the texture, to see the thing in front of me right now. But unfortunately, everything was online. Sounds like it may have even made the project stronger, pushed you to discover new routes, right? And now you've got yeah. back to museums and libraries. You can use them, but you've also exactly, got the internet. Yeah. And also, like, for example, I'm close to the Vets Museum. And every single year, they always repeat this collection that they have, which is a massive collection, which is kind of beautiful. I think some of the artworks borrowed from the Standard Bank collection. So it's like artworks from 1920s. Some of the things that you won't find on the internet, which is kind of beautiful when you go to museums and galleries, because you get to see every single thing that is almost like dusty. That can't be washed, because if you wash it, it then just breaks down. So it is in its original condition, and the beads, everything. And even those gold weights, like the Ashanti gold weights, it's quite beautiful like, to actually see it. Mm. Incredible. Colonization runs many levels deep, right? How do we make the right balance of understanding what came before and then still understanding that whatever is here already somehow fits into our culture as well? Yeah, true. Like for me, sometimes I do both because I feel like the African culture, uh, African tradition sometimes, most of them are quite disappearing. For example, if you look at the tradition of Lobola, which is the bride price, yes, that has evolved. That has changed so much that what we have now could be literally be um, a tradition that was created 20 years ago. And then if you had to go back 200 years ago, people are like, no, 
I'm trying to say that I'm cheap, right? Like it depends on the project. Sometimes I take it as it is before the interruption and I use that as it is. Or I take the past and now and, and merge it together to create something new. The reason why I think it's all because of the context. I think it will just depend on what is your question, like whatever purpose it is. If it is a purpose of preserving, then it's almost like taking as it is, right? And then say, cool, this is the Andingra symbols. And this cloth is from 1875. And this is what it meant. And then if you're now talking about how to then teach the future youngsters of Nigeria about Andingra, maybe let's create a new writing system inspired by the Andingra. Then we take the Andingra and then create a new writing system. And then here it is called Andingra Future, you see, which is now a new writing system that can be coded. It is the truth. In the next 20 years, we won't be able to really find out what some of the things meant. We need to be able to document every single thing from the past as far as we can go. And then we can say, cool, we cannot use Andingra as to write a full sentence, but we can use it to create maybe a new writing system or whatever we want to create or a new coding system. Here's what we've created. This is inspired by this. I think both can be used depending on what the purpose is. I think also from just the conversation we are having, a big part is connecting with our past, with our traditions, so as to be able to break the kind of boundaries that have been created with time. And I guess through that, we're able to recreate and you know, redesign new things in different ways. That's important. Yeah. yeah. I guess also just thoughts on that was that sometimes there's like a fog, right? We're not even sure what came before, right? Which traditions, yes. which cultures yes. are actually African and which... We're now saying that maybe old fashioned, but they're actually colonial or post colonial. Yes. Right? Yep. So true. And I think that is where I think sometimes as designers, like for me, even when I'm researching these elements or these artifacts, I have to literally go deep and ask. For example, when you look at the Basotho blankets, like the ones that they were, those lines, right? According to history, those lines were a mistake by the printers, but those lines have become part of the tradition. And again, they were a gift to the king, but now they're part of the culture. And again, we cannot say no because it is part of culture to grow. Hybridity, right? The mixing of cultures. And for me, it is that, like to research and ask, where does this come from? Can I use it for this? For example, the African uh, fabrics. Most of them are from Netherlands, you see? Now when we say we're doing a wedding, like we're wearing the African print. But these current African culture come from Netherlands. Oh. These are also here within our culture. I'm Maasai and we're known for this red checkered red. shows, but yeah. really their origin seems like it's Scotland. Before we used to have just cowhide as clothes and now the red is associated with Maasai. And yet I would assume before the colors were more brown perhaps yeah. because of yeah. the cow, you know, stuff like exactly. these, the beads, yeah. right? This one made by women in the village, but these are plastic beads. And they told us initially they used to use cowrie shells and bones. And yes. then through trade, this happened. Yeah. And this is now really what stands out in the culture. So exactly. again, like relearning what's changed with time and what can we go back to again? You know, what yeah. the balance between modern balance. and traditions and, and yes. changes. We, we say that these plastic mm. beads are part of Kenyan culture. But what happened before that? Right. Yes. Well, <laughs> before we had the plastic. Yeah, true. So true. you said Basoto blankets. Can you tell us the story the, um, that they were printed by accident? Yeah, I think if my history is correct, the first blanket was a gift to the king. It didn't have any lines in it. In the Sutu, it's very cold. I know there's a certain time in the year where there's literally snow in the Sutu and the people go skiing there. And before that, they used animal hide. It only makes sense because that's what they had. And then when the traders came quite recently, I think around 1800s or like 1700s, they gifted the king with the blanket. And then that became almost like a symbol. And then with the whole talks going through, they then started bringing more blankets. And then one time when they were printing the blankets overseas, there was a mistake. And then that is where the line in between, those two lines. If you Google about pseudo blanket, there's always those lines in between. Those were a mistake. It was a printing error. It was an initial design. And then they didn't stop. They're like, oh, well, it is what it is. And they just continue that. So you cannot now have a pseudo blanket without those lines. Like how this thing is just... Interesting. <laughs> Accidental <laughs> things. Yeah. Accidental exactly. Things. Really, yeah. a lot of things are like, redefined with time. Yeah. Mm. I'm trying to think of a good cultural one, but I can tell you that on the, um, Mac OS, when you hold an icon over a folder to drag it into the folder the folder flashes twice and opens 
Oh, wow. Originally, that was meant to be a folder opening animation, but the developer never got there. And that was in 1983 or <laughs> that they put that in as a placeholder and they've never gotten rid of it. It's always stayed as a double flash instead of an animation. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> we went further into African folklore. Osmond has a book that talks about the different religions across Africa. And Nyami Nyami is one of those stories. So then if you go to Kariba, there's like a big dam, beautiful dam. And then whilst they're building it, there were floods, crazy floods. That were really unexplained. But then the story goes that Nyami Nyami had crossed over. And then when they built the dam, the wife was trapped on the other side. So the Nyami Nyami was on one side, the wife was on the other side. The dam is literally preventing the two from meeting. And sometimes there's a tremors. Apparently it's Nyami Nyami. I'm trying to go back to the wife. However, the story of Nyami Nyami is that Nyami Nyami is a river god, head of a fish, a body of a snake. The Batonga people used to pray to Nyami Nyami, and Nyami Nyami always provided. If there was a drought, Nyami Nyami would offer his tail, and the people would come and cut it, and they would go home and eat, and then Nyami Nyami would regrow. If you go to Kariba, you would literally see like a sculpture that represents Nyami Nyami. Where can people find you? Where should people look out for you online? I'm available on Instagram. Not all the time, but I respond to my DMs. Facebook. I don't check my Facebook. <laughs> but yeah, people can find me on Instagram literally all the time, or they can DM me at Mampoposi. Literally those platforms. Or if you're going to send me a message via Behance at Osmond Chuma. Yeah, I think I'm a good person. I respond to messages. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Even though sometimes emails give me like anxiety, but I do respond. <laughs> Does your name have a meaning? Well, Chuma, I don't know. I'm not sure. But Osmond apparently has to do something with protector, godly protector, something to do with it. It's a Western name, a Western or like Arabic name, meaning godly protector. Chuma, I have no idea what Chuma means. I think maybe that's a very good question. I should go ask what Chuma means. Is that your full name or what is your full name? Well, that's a secret. <laughs> that's a secret. <laughs> yeah, in my family, I'm the only child who doesn't have a middle name. But it doesn't mean that I don't have a middle name. I have a middle name, just that when they register my birth certificate, they didn't register my name. Full name is Osmond Mfanenkosi Chuma. Mfanenkosi means prince. So godly protector, prince Chuma. Wow. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. I think you're the first platform to get that juicy story. <laughs> Thank you. We we're trying. I'm glad Naitiam will slip that question in because every one yeah. of the last three or four people we've interviewed, we've yeah. tried to ask them their name and it always turns into an interesting story. Yeah. And my parents never called me by my name, Osmond. Never. It was always uh, my father. Even up until I was grown, they never said Osmond. And I think it was always weird. I think when I came to university, when people used to say Osmond, I'm like, who are you guys calling? Because my friends would call me Oz, and my mom and my dad would call me Mafana. When people used to call me with my full name, I always be like, who are you calling? <laughs> you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My name is Osmond. Oh, cool. oh yeah. Sorry. What were you saying again? <laughs> so it's like an inside family thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun, yeah. a lot of learning. And yeah, it's always good to meet such amazing creatives like you. Beautiful Thank work. You. Thank you so Thank much. Yeah. I love design and history and seeing how those things always had a big impact on me and getting to meet people and seeing how they've all had an impact on us and getting to learn from each other. Also understanding that a lot of these stories we're having to discuss and we're having to even double check because maybe we don't even know the full history hasn't even been discovered. So it's still there, right? Yeah. 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 And it's very encouraging for me, even as an African creative, to see how much we can gain from our history and how we can use our creativity to redefine our own path. So just seeing all this knowledge and ideas from all over Africa is very inspiring. And Thank you. what you said earlier, you said that African culture hasn't been the coolest. Well, maybe I would dispute that coming from Europe, where I feel like I've brought myself up on a dry diet of European design, right? And that aesthetically, and I mean, coming from music, coming from everything aesthetically and, and creatively, there's so much that people haven't been familiar with so far and this is like bringing new things to them so it's actually exciting yeah for, for yeah. the planet true and i think everybody that is in my inner circle we are literally exploring how we can show africa to the world because that is what i know i think for me when i see african art or african inspiration it's quite futuristic for example like when you look at the pyramids right how do they cut them so clean right they had to polish them to make that edge perfect that is futuristic <laughs> how did you cut that? And of course, they were carving it. And some of these 
wooden elements or sculptures. When I look at this thing, it's cool. This thing is from 1700s, but I'm like, this is like 2065. This is like year 3000. And of course, you will see that these guys were dealing in some technology that we still haven't figured out. There's a culture in Africa that they've got a dance based on a certain star or moon. This tribe has known this for many years. But I think this moon or star was only discovered recently in the 1950s. But these guys have known this like for a very long time. This is the Dogon tribe of Mali in West Africa. The Dogon are believed to be of Egyptian descent. They're renowned for their knowledge about the Sirius system, which dates back to 3200 BC, long before scientists discovered it in 1862. Sirius A is a bright star, which can be seen in the western sky through the naked eye, but Sirius B is invisible. The Dogon people knew that Sirius B was very small but very dense. The star wasn't even photographed until it was done by a large telescope in 1970. How did a people who lacked any kind of astronomical devices know so much about an invisible star? So we are, yes, referencing the past, but we are referencing the past as the future. That is how we as Africans can also protect ourselves and protect our culture so that when the young generation come up, they were like, Dad, please tell me about Nyami Nyami. Oh, okay, cool, let me tell you about Nyami Nyami. For example, have a Nyami Nyami movie, have a Nyami Nyami animation, things like that. That's what we're doing, like to try and say, yo, it is actually cool, it is actually inspiring. For us, that research is quite deep, also very important, and it just doesn't help us, but it helps everybody. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thank you so Thank much. You. Have an amazing weekend. Cool. Same to you. Cheers. If you've made it this far, have ideas for episodes or know somebody we should feature, please let us know. Full episode transcripts are available at our website, africa.design. All the links are in the description. We're available on all your favorite podcast platforms. I'm Adrian Yankoviak. This episode was edited by David Kingori. And thank you for tuning in to Africa Design. <laughs>